My guest on the phone today is renowned violin player that is a former member of a Vie- of the Vienna Chamber Opera and has shared the stage with many great national and international musicians. Wondering who we are chatting with today? Hmm, Mr. Rupert Gunter who is no stranger to the Perth Blues music scene. We are lucky enough to have him on the phone for a bit of a gas bag about what he's been up to and what he's got coming up in store for us all this year. Hi, Rupert. Thank you for calling in. Hey, Tamara. Thanks. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person today. That's okay. Here we are. I really understand. It is super duper hot here. So, um, yeah, I completely understand. And you're living up in the, like, right... A, you know, a couple of hours out of town anyway, aren't you? Yeah, we're up in the Wheat Belt. Beautiful area too. Um, <clears throat> so, you've been a musician for many a year, not that you're old or anything, but you've been doing your craft for a while. How does a classical violinist become a blues man? Well, I grew up in a really um, intensely classical-only family, and it was only um, really later in life, in my, you know, when I left home, I started to hear things like blues and um, a lot more rock and roll. And um, I don't know, I, I guess I heard some, when I was a kid in the 70s, I heard some um, really good electric violin and it sort of stuck with me. And over the years of doing all the classical things, there was this little voice in the back of my mind just saying, hey, what about that? So anyway, I got involved in it and I... I really gravitated to the blues, especially immediately, because it's, uh, I guess, after the classical environment, it's got a really kind of masculine energy to it. Not exclusively, of course. And I don't mean it's the domain of men or anything like that. It's no. just got, there's a certain sort of, for someone like me who'd grown up in a, such a sheltered world, hmm. the blues kind of brought me back to earth. And I think the violin, um, Apart from, I think it sounds great because it sounds a bit like a harmonica, a bit yeah. like a violin, and sound like a guitar. It actually sounds. Sorry, can I just interrupt you? Say it actually yeah. sounds like a real cross between a harmonica and a guitar together. So basically, if a harmonica and a guitar mated and had a child, it would be that sound of a violin. I think. Yeah, and look, if you look back in the history, but go back to the recordings in the nineteen thirties, most of the blues bands were actually a couple of violins. And a banjo and a guitar. Yeah. Everything changed with the electric guitar later, but the violin, as I often remind, the blues aficionados, <laughs> the violin was actually the, one of the originators. You listen to Baby Please Don't Go from Big Joe Williams' 1933 recording. Yeah. The, the violin does all the riffing on it. Yeah. So it's it's really got a big place in the history. It just got a bit rubbed out by the guitar after the 1940s. Yeah, righto. And it's funny because I remember seeing you play years and years ago and I was just like, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. I just was really taken by it. I really loved what you were doing and I love what you do. So well, you. you're very welcome. You're in the middle of a couple of shows, one that's already been on the 3rd of December and one that's coming up on the 27th of January called Born Under a Bad Sign. I've got to ask you where that name came from. What delights do listeners have to look forward to at the show? Well, Born Under a Bad Sign, this is the one on the 27th yeah. of January. That's, um, <clears throat> it's all my favourite Old blues artists. I've, I've got three original albums of my own material that yep. I've written and performed a lot. But the um, this this concert is dedicated to the old guys who I heard, you know, when I was younger and and aspired to, you know, Muddy Waters, Howling Wolf, yep. um, Bob and Bland, a whole lot of people in there who shaped the blues for everyone. You yep. know, very close all those guys when they were young guys back in the 1960s. So these people were the... They were the people who sort of transmitted the blues to the wet to the Western Anglo audiences. Yeah, and um, so I've got a lot of respect for that. For me, it's a bit like playing tribute by playing some Beethoven or something in the classical world. Yeah, it's. It, I have to say, um, it is really like I, I, when we finish the interview. I'm actually going to play uh, your wrong, your song "Surrender." Um, that you did with Paul Armitage from the Gratitude album, just because I want to give listeners a chance to see just how versatile you are, because that they're such beautiful, such beautiful songs. Everything I've heard you do is just always so beautiful. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, the violin lends itself to all sorts of things, and I guess because of 
my background in the classical first and then across world music and blues. Yeah. Um, it does seem to be a passport to all of that. But in terms of the show, so we've got all this music from the old blues masters, wonderful band with um, Hans Deberts on bass. Oh, lovely man. Pete Charlesworth on, on drums, who's mm. actually a jazz drum background, but he's really got a special touch for blues and the electric mm. violin, and I do all the vocals. Lovely. And, um, it's just a great sound, but the traditional three-piece mm. blues band, just violin, uh, bass and drums instead of guitar, bass and drums. I don't mm. think anyone's going to be disappointed. No, so, I don't think so. It's a fascinating show, and you know we'll 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 be able to rip the rip the, the fur off your blankets. It'll be it won't be anything of a pushover show. It's a it's a you know it's a it's at the quarry, so you're sitting on yeah. you're sitting on the lawn on your blanket on you're having a picnic. You know, there's in a beautiful lawn. beautiful place with great music. What more can you ask for? Yeah, and I think the blues is an uplifting thing, you know. I think it sort of speaks to your soul mm. even if it's a song about all sorts of misfortune and lots of stuff going wrong. Yeah. Somehow it lifts you up. It does. You said before when I asked you about how you became a blues man and you said that, you know, that you sort of met the blues and you felt like it was kind of, uh, you know, more um, – uh, what did you say? More manly or something. But I think what I can hear and what I get from that is that – Classical music is so beautiful, but it's almost very light, like a little fairy jumping across water, whereas the blues is guttural. It really hits you in that guttural solar plexus, boof area, and it's just so gutsy, you know? It's, uh, yeah, sorry, I just, I've been thinking about what that, when you said that, and it's just, I love, I love that about the blues. I love how guttural and just how it hits you right in that, that base area of your body, you know? It's, mm. It's delicious. <laughs> yes, yes. Very totally, and very grounding, and yeah. and I think it's like it's very you know think about all the all the um, Afro American music is very rhythmic compared yeah. to classical music. Yeah, so it's not a, it's not about anything being better. Oh it's no, just, definitely not. And it, it like you said, it just tucks into a different part of your life and your body and and your person, and it just brings that kind of. Um, brings brings you to life in a different way. I think it makes you want to dance. You know, it just makes you want to move because it's so good. But anyway, um, where, where, actually, just quickly, so where does the name Born Under a Bad Sign come from? Is it an, the name of one of the songs? Yeah, it is. I thought so. I thought I'd heard it before. Yeah, guitarist Albert King had a huge yeah. hit with it in the early 70s and it was actually written by um, uh, Booker T. Jones who yeah. uh who did all the backing for Otis Reading and people yeah. like that. Booker wrote it. Um, I've actually heard him play it live Lovely. a few years ago with his keyboards and it was really something else. And anyway, so we do we do that we do feature that song and we thought it was such a great song that we'd name the show after it. Nice, so, nice. So very quickly, because uh, I am running out a bit of time here, but when do you think we'll see a new album? Well, I've got I've got that on my list. I've written mm -hmm. these three albums of original material yeah. over the last ten years, and um, this is going to be the year where we're going to record them all. So I'm hoping we'll have the first one out by July. Fantastic! Uh, if you weren't a musician, what else do you think you'd have done or been or yeah? Well, I'd probably do what I do alongside that, which is I'm, I'm a meditation teacher. Oh, great! do a lot of self-esteem and well-being coaching as well. So Tanya and I both work with that. And so that's sort of like a parallel um, passion and love of mine. So yeah. that's probably what I would have gravitated. But music music and meditation and self, you know, self-development, all these things, I think they're all very close ground. They work hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. They really do. Um, okay, last question. For other musicians out there wanting to break out of their traditional genres or stereotyping of their instrument, what advice do you have? Well, apart from coming to see my show and <laughs> to see it in action, um, I would say go find the people who, who turn you on musically. Go listen to them yeah. if you can meet them, if you can talk to them and ask them those sort of questions and if you can play with the best people you can who are doing the closest thing to what you want to do. Yeah, so I hear that. I got here by lots of leg ups from very kind people who were way ahead of me. Hmm. And that's how that's how I got here. So awesome. Pay it forward. Yeah, that's the way. And you know, one thing that comes to my mind is um, is 
you know, I love hearing the violin, but also something that I've really enjoyed is hearing uh, there's a couple of ladies who play the bagpipes um, in a bluesy way. And I've really enjoyed like watching, like, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. I was showing a friend and she was like, it sounds like the cat's getting its tail pulled. I was like, I really like it. I'd love to hear that. I mean, you know. If you Google... So, sorry, if you Google on uh, YouTube, or, or like if you go onto YouTube and you put um, uh, bagpipes, uh, lady plays the bagpipes blues or something like that, there is this little blonde bombshell, tiny little lady, and she's like buxom, but she just like really just whacks it out with this like um, bagpipe. So please, I really would love for you to check it out. I'd love to hear what you think about it. <laughs> I will, and I'll, and I'll remind everybody that you know Bon Scott had that in uh, Long Way to Long Way to the Top. Yeah, that the bagpipes are in there. I do. There's something about the bagpipes. I, I, not all the time, but there's just something about them. Sometimes when you hear them in the band and stuff as well, it's music is just such a powerful, powerful thing. We're so lucky, aren't we? Yeah, it's a great thing, and it's, I think that's the whole the whole story is it's about reaching people. That's it. That's it. Thank you so much for calling today, Rupert. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you today. My pleasure, and um, we'll talk to you later, but if you want to come to the show, we'll sort something out. Thank you. Oh, I really appreciate that. That's so awesome. So be sure to go and see Rupert Gunter and his all-star cast band on the 27th of January for um, Born Under a Bad Sign at the Quarry Amphitheatre. I uh, I wish you a lovely year. Happy New Year. And uh, thank you so much, Rupert. Thanks, Tamara. Year of the Dragon. (laughs) 